to um, Psalm 107. Um, there's a couple things in there I want to touch on that John had touched on um, last week or the week before. Uh, and while you're doing that, just a uh, commercial. Uh, the shoe boxes are due this Sunday. So if you have your shoe boxes ready, bring them Sunday. If you don't have them ready, go buy some stuff and uh, bring them back. Psalm 107. You know, um, recently I started riding the train back into work. So uh, I'm really, really feeling it. Um, used to be I'd roll out of bed at like 7.55 and I'd say, you know, good morning, Lord, you know. And this week it's uh, getting up at 5.45 and it's, oh, Lord, it's morning. <laughs> so forgive me if I seem to be dragging. Um, you know, I've been thinking about that. Of, You know, it's Thanksgiving coming up soon. And to be honest with you, my attitude has been pretty bad the last couple of weeks because I've been looking not so forward to getting up and riding the train uh, every day to downtown Dallas. And uh, it's been okay. It's been not as bad as I thought. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's nothing like rolling out of bed, taking a quick shower, and then sitting there in your, you know, your fuzzy slippers and your robe and getting online. Not that I'd ever do that. My boss is watching. But um, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Um, it actually took me a long time to get used to working at home. Um, and I remember at first Ruby didn't like it uh, because I was always chasing her around, asking her what was for dinner, what was for lunch, what was for breakfast. And then she got kind of used to it. And now I think she kind of misses me a little bit. Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, just been thinking about Thanksgiving and, and having the right perspective. Um, Psalm 107, in verse 8 and 9, it says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he searches, excuse me, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. You know, that's the right perspective. You know, that's the way to look at things. When we have the right perspective, then yeah, you know, we're giving thanks to the Lord. You know, and we, we realize that his works are wonderful, you know, and that the only thing that can satisfy our soul is him. Um, look at verse 21. It says basically the same thing. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. You know, this psalm is filled with times where the, the uh, Israelites, the children of Israel, had failed and had fallen into iniquity. And, and on, the psalmist is saying, you know, oh, if they would only, you know, have the right perspective. You know, I want to propose to you that having the right perspective comes from what I would label the most powerful thing in the universe, which is ideas. You know, if you have the right ideas, if you're thinking right about God, if you're thinking right about the world, you're, if you have a biblical worldview, then things make sense. And then you're logically going to come to the conclusion that I should thank God because he's good. You know, God is good. And if we know that, then we hold on to that. Then, you know, we can get through anything, basically. Um, turn to verse 43 in that same chapter, that same psalm. It says, Whoever is wise, you know, wisdom, it's the correct application of knowledge. You know, and, and that's, that's important because there's a lot of data around us. You know, we look at the world, you see what's happening, you see how things result in wars and famines and pestilences and things like that. And you can take that information, you get pretty discouraged. Or you can take that information and realize that, you know, God's still on the throne and he's still taking care of me and my family. And he's still saving people from, you know, eternal damnation. Whoever is wise will observe these things. So the things in the world, they're the same. You know, events, material things. What's different is the way that people perceive those things. What's different is the way that we look at those things, how we process them. So he says, whoever is wise, whoever correctly applies knowledge, will observe these things and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. See, 
that's the only conclusion you can draw if you have your worldview established on the fact that yes, there is a God, he created everything, he created me, I'm created in his image, and he has a purpose and a plan for my life. Now with that, turn to the book of Jude, which is way to the other side, to the right. Right before the revelation. And, and, and Jude is an interesting book because Jude talks about, he warns about an apostasy. You know, Jude sees the seeds of what's called Gnosticism on the horizon. He sees that infecting the church. And he wants to talk to us believers about that. And, 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 and I want to make a connection. Um, you know, false teachers, when they come in and they give false ideas, false teachings, right? And, and that kind of goes in hand in hand with having the right ideas, the right thoughts. Because it's when we have the wrong thoughts. You know, when I forget that, oh, thank God that I have a job and that I get a paycheck and that I can feed my wife and I can go and buy toys for Sophia, um, things like that. Then I, I have the right perspective when I realize, you know, the only reason I even have breath in my lungs is that I can go to work and that they gave me a job. I don't know why they gave me a job. I, I, well, anyway, um, is because God created me and he has a plan for my life. Remember last time we talked about having a destiny. So what, what I want to kind of do here is, is look at what Jude says is in the beginning, basically the characteristics of how we should be, what we should have in our lives versus what happens when false ideas or false teachings creep into the church and then some of the characteristics of these false ideas and false teachers and kind of draw a contrast. So bear with me. I hope I can do this. It made sense to me, but hopefully I can convey it. Um, in chapter, well, there's only one chapter. Verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Okay, so Jude, most scholars think that he is the brother of, of Jesus, the half-brother and the brother of James. I, I, I concur with that. Uh, it's interesting that he sees himself as a doulos, as a bond servant. He's not bragging, hey, I'm Jesus' brother. That's what I'd be doing. I'm Jesus' brother. But then someone would probably remind him, well, hey, you didn't really support him during his ministry. You guys kept putting him down and, and telling him that he was crazy. Um, but anyway, he comes out and he says he's a bond servant. To those who are called, sanctified by the, God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So what I'd like to do is, is, is say that, you know, he's saying to those who are called, um, that's probably the effectual calling to salvation, okay? Um, those who are sanctified, better translation is beloved by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. See, that's how God's intention for us is. This is how he sees us. He sees us, and Jude is recognizing that, that we're called by God. You know, God has a purpose for our lives. He saved us. You know, and, and, and we're sanctified. We're loved. We're, we're loved. And we need to remember that. And he also says that we're preserved in Jesus Christ. Um, in John, I think it's chapter 17. Why don't you guys turn there real quick. John 17, I'll start at verse 20. Um, Jesus has been praying for his disciples. And then he says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. See, he was praying for the apostles, or the disciples, the 11. But he's also praying for us, because we're the ones that come to faith through their words. And so he goes on and he says in verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, 
I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. See, he's praying for a unity that existed within the, um, the triune God, you know, from eternity past. You know, God is, is always love, right? And love requires um, an object. And for God to have been always love, you know, we say that within the, the triune God, you know, there was this loving relationship. And Jesus is praying that we're going to somehow have a part in that. We're going to be into that intimacy that he already had with the Father from eternity past. And so, it's, it's, it, in a way, it's how we're preserved in him. And, and remember in John 15 where he says to abide? So, just kind of want to throw that in there. Now, go back to Jude. Again, you know, he says that we are called, we're beloved by the Father, we're preserved in Christ. And then he says in verse 2, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. You know, that's, that's an awesome thing. He's not just saying mercy um, to us and peace to us and love to us, but I really believe he's saying that it's going to come from us as well. And, and it's multiplied. So not only are we, have we received the mercy of God and the peace of God, but we are to be merciful people, like it says in the Beatitudes. Um, we have the peace of God, right? We, when, we, when we made peace with God when we were saved, you know, then we got the peace of God. But now we're to be peacemakers as well. And then it says, and love be multiplied to you. See, this is how we're supposed to be when we have the right perspective, when we know who we are in Christ, and when we're thinking right, then this is how our life is supposed to flow. But he's going to warn these people about the possibility of losing that. In verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So he was going to write a letter just talking about the common salvation that we have, about salvation in general. But because of what was going on around him, you know, he found it necessary to write this exhorting letter to contend for the faith, to fight for the faith. You know, the faith he's talking about is what was delivered and handed down by the apostles, the apostles' doctrine. And he's, he's saying that there's a need to do that. Well, why? Verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you see, there's a contrast there between us, you know, the words he uses for us, <coughs> mercy, peace, love, uh, beloved, called, preserved in Christ. But these guys, you know, they come in and they turn the grace of God into this, this lewdness. Um, lewdness is, what, what word did we use here? Excuse me. And this is what happens when you have to live on a lot less sleep. <laughs> Unrestrained vice or gross immorality. Um, and they deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, they denied the lordship, the lordship of Christ. Again, you know, when we're thinking correctly, when we realize that he's the Lord of our life, when we realize what he's done for us and how we're to live in him, then we manifest the fruits of the Spirit. We live a certain way, and we have certain benefits. But these people are introducing these ideas that are not like that. The ideas that they're going to lead are very selfish, very self-loving, very self-interested, very self-motivated. Um, let's look at verse 5. 
But I want to remind you, though once you knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Do you remember what happened with that when they went up to Kadesh Barnea? Excuse me. They were at the uh, entrance of the promised land. And they're there and they send in the spies. And Joshua and Caleb come out and they say, hey, you know, we can do this. You know, they're big, yeah, but we can take them with God. And the other spies were saying, no, we're like grasshoppers to them. And they were like really discouraged. And they had done this after they had seen the Red Sea parted. <laughs> they had seen all the plagues in Egypt. You know, all these things had happened. And yet, they, in unbelief, they, 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 they witnessed the work of God, but they still chose poorly. Why? It's because of how they processed it. It's the ideas that they had. They had wrong ideas about God. They didn't believe him. They didn't have faith. Remember they kept telling Moses all through the, the, the whole thing, like, why did you bring us out here? To kill us? You know? And, and sometimes we think that way about God. You know, I do sometimes. I, I don't think he's going to kill me. Well, I don't think he's going to kill me, but sometimes I find myself um, complaining. You know, I find myself being bitter. Or I find myself being uh, dissatisfied or discontent. I know you guys are all shocked, right? <laughs> but it happens because there's so many bad ideas out there. There's so many bad systems of belief out there. And they're colliding with us all the time. You cannot turn on the TV and not hear something that's going to be anti-Christian, anti-biblical, anti-God. You know, it, it's just there. It's all around us. And we have to know, you know, it's even in the church. It, 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 you have the church of, well, I'm not going to go there. But anyway, um, but there are different churches that, that don't promote Christianity. And um, we're going to see some of these false teachers. If you watch a lot of Christian television, you might think of some people as we're going through here. Um, but see, it's, it's this whole idea about the ideas. And it's about grasping on to the worldview that we have that's based in Scripture and, and holding on to that and not allowing these things to influence us. He goes on, he says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the, the great day. You know, angels, I mean, how close to God can you get? Seriously, I mean, they're in his pre they were in his presence. Now, this could be uh, Genesis 6, where it talks about the sons of God. You know, the angels came down. Some people think they cohabited with women and things like that. Um, I'm not going to tell you where I stand on that, because I don't want you all to feel bad that you're probably wrong. <laughs> um, it could just be the general fall. You know, when he came down, he took a third of the angels with him, Satan. Uh, it could mean that. But do you see what, what, what Judah's saying? Here, these Israelites, these children of Israel who had been with Moses, who had God in their midst, you know, and, 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 and he had led them out of Egypt with a strong hand, I think it says in Scripture. And yet they still, they still rebelled. They still didn't have faith. They still had the wrong ideas, the wrong thoughts about God. And then the angels... I mean, well, how, how does an angel, <laughs> how, do you, how does that happen? Well, we know with Satan, with Lucifer, it was pride. And, and pride's going to be the seed of most of this. Um, verse 7, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Um, it, 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 it's, 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 it's pride, it's selfishness, it's putting your eyes on the sensual, on the things that are in front of us. You know, that's what Satan wants to do. Um, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Mike, if we get to communion at about 9.30, that's good? Okay. 
Maybe that's what John was talking about. Keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> Go stop. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1. Excuse me again. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You won't surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. And she gave also, oh, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. But you see what, what he's doing? Remember in the, um, in the wilderness where Jesus was being tempted as well? It's the same area. It's, 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 it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and it's the pride of life. It's the external. It's the sensual. It's the things that we can get caught up, you know, because we love ourselves. <laughs> we do. Every morning we have to get up and push ourselves off the throne of our soul <laughs> and put God there. That's just the reality of it. But when we don't do that, when we fail to do that, we can become more and more deeply entrenched in a soulish type life. And when the false teachers or false ideas come and they tickle our ears, it's like, hey, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, I am, I'm, not, I'm pretty good at that, yeah. I did really well up there on Wednesday night, yeah. You know, and, and you kind of talk yourself into it. But you see how the enemy, he, he tries to manipulate us through pride. That's the center of it all. Um, go back to Jude. Back in verse 7 in Sodom and Gomorrah, you, I, it's hard to talk about this in mixed company, but you remember the sin where um, they wanted to have their way with these visitors who were angels. You know, just think of it this way. You know, they wanted to do what they wanted to do. They were caught up in their own sin to the point where they didn't really think about it. They were basically on a very animalistic plane. Verse 8. Uh, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, <laughs> reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. So these false teachers, they're dreamers because they don't live in reality, because they think that you can be happy by serving yourself or serving them. <coughs> False teachers, a lot of times, will live off the backs of their congregants, of their um, TV viewers, um, and they defile the flesh, they reject authority, they speak evil of dignitaries. Um, where he says speak evil dignitaries, that could be luminaries or even angels. And in verse 9, we're going to see, I, I think he's talking about angels. Have you ever, there's one guy on TV, he, he said this a couple of times, I heard him, it's kind of weird, but it's, it's kind of funny. He says, when that devil comes in and, and messes with you, you just kick him in the teeth, right? You ever, have you ever heard anything like that? It's funny, but it's not because he's saying that they speak evil of dignitaries, you know, angels, they take it lightly that these are spiritual beings. Why? Because they really don't believe. I don't think they do. And in comparison, Jude says, yet Michael, the archangel, you know, when he was contending with the devil, verse 9, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. See, Michael didn't even, like, say, hey, you know, kick you in the teeth. He basically gave it up to the Lord. And he said, the Lord rebuke you. So you see with these guys, they get into these places where they really don't know what they're talking about or what they're doing. But again, it's, it's misinformation. It's, it's bad knowledge. It's, it's bad ideas. And those are very dangerous. Every bad movement in history where people have died, you know, Nazism, communism, 
um, these uh, Mao, they all started with ideas. You know, the power of an idea. Even if it's forced on people, you know, through um, totalitarian dictatorships, the person who's doing the forcing has an idea. And so we have to be careful. Um, verse 10, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, and these things they corrupt themselves. So they're like animals. It says, woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Cain, remember Cain, he um, killed his brother Abel because the Lord didn't receive his offering in the same way. Um, I know I'm asking you guys to turn to a lot of places, but let's see. Turn to Hebrews 11. I think it's good for you guys to turn your pages. They keep you awake. And just to see a, a, a really short commentary on, on, on Cain and Abel. In, in Hebrews 11.4 it says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. You know, they both brought something, right? Do you remember what Cain brought? What do you bring? What? Fruit. Yeah, he brought he brought fruit, right? What did Abel bring? Okay, so it could be that he's talking about a prescribed a prescribed uh, way to worship, right? But what what does it say? Let me read it in Genesis four. It says verse three. 4 3 in Genesis, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. You guys are right. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. You know, could it be because of he brought his best? You know, it, it, it almost seems like Cain just brought something, <laughs> he just wanted to be religious. But Abel brought his best. You know, it, it speaks to the attitude, the ideas, what they thought about God. You can tell that they have different viewpoints of God. One was just, hey, here's some fruit, God. Here's some fruitcake from last year, right? It, but, but, but Abel gave him his best. So again, just keep that in mind. It's, it's these thoughts. It's these ideas. They've run greedily in the era of Balaam, for profit. You guys remember about Balaam and the donkey and how he, um, he, couldn't get, um, he couldn't curse the Israelites, so he convinced the king to send his women in there and to put them into sin. But he did that for money. And they perished, the last part of verse 11, in the rebellion of Korah. You guys remember Korah? He's the one, he said, hey, you Aaron, Moses, and Miriam, or whoever, you guys take too much upon yourselves. You know, the rest of us Levites can be priests too. And then, you know, Moses said, okay, bring your censers and we're going to have a battle thing. And um, ended up that they got swallowed up <laughs> in the earth. Um, but they wanted something. They weren't satisfied with what God had given them. So I think it was Dathan, Abiram, and uh, um, Korah and then their families. So I think it was 250 that brought the censors, and I forget how many got um, killed. But you know, the point is that they didn't want to settle for what God had given them. It wasn't good enough. They wanted something, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And he goes on and he says, these, these false teachers, are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. You know, they don't come in. It, it's, I, I love our potlucks. Um, not just because of the food, but 
it, it's such a nice way just to get to know people, to serve each other, to, to care about one another, to get to know. But these guys, you know, in these love feasts, which generally would lead to communion, apparently, you know, they were there just getting, you know, feed me, feed me, feed me. You know, it, and again, it's, it's sensual. It's, it's, it, it's something where they're, they're selfish. And he says, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. These guys are they're like clouds that, you know, you see a cloud, you think it's going to rain here in Dallas, but it never rains. But then you don't see a cloud, and all of a sudden it's raining. It's kind of weird. But it's like that. You know, you see this cloud, you expect it to be full of water. You expect something to happen, and it doesn't. Um, they're like these, these trees. They're not just dead trees, but they're dead trees that have been pulled out of the ground. There's no way they're going to have any fruit. You know, that's how these guys are. So they may look promising. They may say things. And the ideas are the same way. And the ideas can be promising. They can sound good. And what does it say in the Proverbs? You know, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of those ways is the ways of death, right? Um, so we have to be careful. He goes on and he says, they're like raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. You know, stars... Shooting stars you can't use to navigate, right? Because they're there and they're gone. So they're like that. Yeah, they look nice, but you can't follow them, is what he's saying. You can't follow those men. You can't follow those types of ideas. And he goes on in verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So ungodliness, you know, God's going to judge this stuff. You know, we're Christians, okay? And if you're born again Christian, I sincerely believe that, you know, you can't lose your salvation. But I also believe that you could be taken to the woodshed and disciplined and possibly even taken out if you're useless to God. And that's just my personal thing. I don't, I'm not saying that's a Calvary teaching, but that's how I see Scripture. Um, but imagine if we are destined here for purpose, and we start to let these ideas influence us, and we start becoming not so useful. You know, we're only here once, Right? And if we spend our time on ideas that come and go, getting our ears tickled, and maybe not bringing anybody into the kingdom, um, that's kind of a waste. It's kind of futile. And, and the other thing is, the type of gospel that these guys were teaching may not even have been efficacious. <laughs> it may not have been. Um, it almost sounds kind of like they were naming and claiming guys. You know? But... Um, so just, it's real important, the ideas that we allow to filter into our lives and to come out of us, that we live out in our Christian walks. Um, he goes on, and he just says that in verse 15 again, that God's going to judge these things. In verse 16, he says, these are grumblers. Now, this is present tense. So in his day, he was describing that batch of false teachers. Okay, But notice the, con the contrast between these characteristics that we're going to read right now and the ones that we read in verses 1 and 2, these are grumblers. <laughs> They're complainers. They're walking according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words. You know, they can say things that sound grand and grandeur, you know, just they, they sound like they're orators. And, they, and they, they have these flattering words. They flatter people to gain advantage. You know, they're insincere. But again, look at that. You know, in, in verses 1 and 2, you know, we're called, we're beloved, we're preserved in Christ. You know, we should be having mercy, peace, and love multiplied in our lives. But these ideas, these people that bring these ideas, you know, they're grumblers. And they create grumblers. You know, because if you think that you should have a Rolls Royce because you are a Christian and you don't have one, I'd grumble. I want my Rolls Royce, at least a, a newer truck, right? But, you know, again, it's false conceptions. 
They're complainers. They're walking according to their own lusts. You know, the Christian life isn't about me. It's about him, right? Remember joy. Jesus, others, and then you. You're last. You want joy in your life. You're last. Right? We learned with the kids last weekend um, about being uh, the greatest in the kingdom. Servant of all, right? Kids had a hard time with that. <laughs> they really did. It was really hard to explain. But you get the picture. Um, verse 17. We're going to run through these last few. But you, beloved. Okay, but you. Okay, you don't. But you. Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So remember the apostles' doctrine. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. You know, everything you see on TV pretty much is ungodly. <laughs> I love TV. I mean, I really do. There's some shows. I'm like one of those people, my wife and I, that, you know, we'll watch Netflix, we'll watch something we've never seen before, and we'll go through season 1, 2, 3, 17, 21, and we're there just, you know, popcorn. <laughs> we're like zombies. We're like, you know, Netflix zombies. Um, I love it. Some of this stuff's actually pretty good. But if you watch it, you know, you see the worldview of the person who wrote the script and the people who are producing it. It comes through. And some of them aren't so bad. Some of them are really bad. Okay, who, who watches, um, what's it called? With the president? No? Don't say, yeah, okay. Don't forget it. I didn't ask that. Um, that one's bad, but that one, it's actually, anyway. Um, <laughs> how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Now these guys are in it for themselves, and that's the kind of disciples they produce. They produce people who are in it for themselves. Guess what? If we have a church full of people who are in it for themselves, are we ever going to get anything done? <laughs> no. Because everybody's going to be lining up to be the next guy to be up here when John isn't here, right? Or, or to be the head of something or whatever. The body of Christ doesn't work that way. You know, it's all based on the fact that we're here to serve. We're here to be servants. And, and it works on the fact that if we have the right concept of who God is, you can be nothing other than humble and loving and kind. Even though we're not like that all the time, that's the goal. Verse 19, these are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. These, these guys come in and they just try to get people to follow after them. But you know what? That happens in churches too. You see splits. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, we start there. We start on our faith. And, and, and I forget if it's first or second Peter. Peter talks about building on faith and knowledge and zeal and all these things. And talks about, um, I forget exactly, but you, you have to start somewhere. And the foundation is our faith in Christ. That's your foundation. If you get that wrong, you, you're, you're, like, you know, you're like in an airplane going in the wrong direction. You know, you're just never going to get where you want to be. You may get everything you want on this earth. You may have all the toys you want, but, you know, um, you're not going to make it to heaven. That's just, you know, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, you know, the, the, the Lord of glory. And so you have to build on that. So we start building ourselves on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, you know. We have to have our prayers guided by the Holy Spirit. When we pray here on Thursday nights, when we open up, usually I'll open up. That's the first thing I pray. I pray that God would lead and guide our prayers and that he would put on our hearts um, to pray what we're going to pray. It's kind of funny because there's some of you that we keep praying for all the time. <laughs> Mike. Mike Kirkpatrick. But we just tell the, the Holy Spirit to lead us. And, and see, that's the whole thing. There's a difference between a, holy, a, a, a prayer and the Spirit, you know, is, is something where you're leading, you're, you're, you're aligning your will with God. And when you do that, then he will give you what you ask. 
It's when we don't do that, we start praying for things we want. Like, like I would assume that these false teachers pray, you know, because it's all about ungodly lust, it's all about sensualness, it's all about their, their me, 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 me. Those prayers probably would never be answered um, unless they're able to dupe people to um, give them their money. And then he goes on and he says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. <laughs> that's the ticket. I, to me, that's, that's, that is the main verse of this um, chapter, this book. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. You see, everything that these false teachers are into is temporal. <laughs> It's temporal. It doesn't, you can't take it with you. But the love of God, you know, um, mercy, eternal life, that's what we have. That's so much better. We just have to learn to keep that in mind because sometimes I just, you know, I, it's hard. <laughs> Again, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, there's a lot of different um, manuscript side notes in these couple of verses that make it really confusing on how to um, interpret this, but basically what I think it means is be careful when you're dealing with people who have been tainted by false teaching or have false ideas, don't let them infect you, okay? You pray for them, you pray with them, but you don't partake. And if it starts sounding good, like, oh, well, what they're doing, they're going to wait. No, don't, don't, don't let that happen. You, we have to be diligent to guard our hearts in our minds. And he goes on and he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory and ex with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. You know, that's, that's the God-centered view of the world. You know, God is our Savior. He, all, divine wisdom comes only from Him. And He deserves, you know, all praise and glory and majesty. He already has it. Whether we give it to Him or not, He has it. But we have the privilege of confirming that, of taking part in that, and acknowledging who He is. You know, because He is God. <laughs> and, and He'll always be God. And then Jude closes with, yeah, amen.